Um, I've just asked them to finish around three or so, three or five perhaps. So there's a couple of uh, minutes for questions uh, afterwards. So part two. All right, so this is completely changing gears, but in fact, uh, if I had the time, you would see that we would come back to this terrific the second uh, vision that I talked about. That is the topic of slow light, um, which I think is still one of the most exciting areas in um, modern physics. Uh, in fact, um, this really hit the headlines about 10 years ago when Lena Howe, who was then at uh, Harvard, reported in Nature that uh, she slowed light down to 17 metres per second in a, uh, an atomic resonance, a cold at atomic system. And this, this hit the headlines. In fact, uh, the next uh, week, uh, or later than the next month, it appeared in the New York Times. And um, the concept that was then introduced was that light had been slowed down to the speed of a bicycle. And uh, of course, that, that just sounds, um, you know, that it violates all sorts of basic laws of physics and uh, outrageous claim. But of course, there's nothing being violated here at all. Um, there's nothing wrong with the notion that light slows down, it slows down when it propagates through grass. Um, although this was a fundamental interest, that there were a number of significant challenges in terms of exploiting this effect. Um, obviously, the first is that this was an atomic resonance. So this was an atom that had been cold down to probably nanokelvin in a lab the size of this room. Uh, and in fact, the um, pulse of light that had been slowed down was very, very long uh, because this was a very narrow band effect. In fact, it was uh, limited only to uh, a few megahertz. So uh, it was a very exciting scientific result, but it didn't really have an application at the time. But it stimulated the community to start to think about this idea of slowing light down. How can we harness this, uh, exploit this, this effect in uh, information processing? And it was really held up as the sort of next grand challenge for photonics. We know how to disperse light. We know how to switch light. Um, can we slow light down? So slow light is essentially the idea of uh, delaying a pulse of light. And that earlier experiment, um, even though they slowed light down to bicycle speed, they actually delayed a pulse of light only that by a very, very small fraction of its width because it was incredibly narrow band. And what matters in information science is, that is slowing the pulse down by a couple of pulse lengths. Okay, if you think of a buffer in a Intel chip, it's actually storing thousands and thousands of bits for, you know, microseconds. Um, so really these are fundamental interests, as I said, and I want to mention that here it's the group velocity of light that matters, it's not the phase velocity that we're um, we're controlling, um, difficult to control the phase velocity. In many of these uh, structures and systems, it's the group velocity uh, that we're controlling. And of course, that's what matters in the context of pulses of light. So as uh, I alluded to, the community uh, came together very quickly uh, and has been very active over the last 10 deca decade, trying to exploit this um, in a number of different ways. Uh, I'll talk about nonlinear effects, but for a number of years, the community was obsessed with the idea of a buffer. I mean, if we could slow light down to the point that we might uh, delay a bit of light by many, many bit lengths, then we might imagine a buffer. And in fact, that turns out to be a critical building block for this next generation of communication systems. Because if we're imagining an optical router, which was the dream for a long time, well, we need to be able to switch information, but we also need to, <coughs> the ability to synchronize data flow, and that, that requires optical buffers. So this is the concept that was, uh, was talked about. And uh, if you can buffer, then you can actually synchronize. Now, I caught a little animation Friday afternoon. Everyone's struggling to stay awake. So what's this all about? What was this all about? Well, I guess in simple terms, what was motivating the engineering community was the notion that, well, if you think about a communication network, the optical fiber links are like the freeways, the highways. Uh, the bottleneck isn't the freeway itself, it's this, uh, the interchange. When you get from, uh, get, you get here, and this is the bottleneck. And this is where buffers are utilized already uh, to take one of these channels and essentially sort of store it and wait for a gap. And so you, let's say you've got that channel there and it's full. 
you need to wait for a gap. And you can see maybe there's a gap there. So you buffer the data for a little bit and then you put it on the channel. Um, of course, so what you're trying to avoid is that simple, simple uh, this, this, this problem here of traffic black collisions. Um, and I guess, <laughs> in very simple terms, in the spirit of Friday afternoon, um, what we're talking about is this following. That's bad. <laughs> My student created this a couple of years ago. <laughs> if you had a slow light buffer, maybe you could do this. I mean, it sounds outrageous, but dozens of groups around the world, DARPA programs, were working towards this goal. And to be honest, it sort of fizzled out. Uh, they've backed off on this because they've realised it is simply too hard. Uh, but let me talk it through anyway. Um, in fact, our research program has had a slightly different take on it. And we've been exploring slow light in uh, periodic structures. So rather than rely on uh, atoms that are frozen, we're imagining structures that we can manipulate. Uh, gratings, metamaterials, and other structures that are sort of man-made, or it's a wrong expression, made, where we can control the group velocity. Um, and in principle, this has a number of fundamental advantages because A, well, it's practically it's not a frozen atom, but B, because we can now control the speed of light over bandwidth that are starting to be compatible with high-speed data networks. So I'll talk through a little bit of our work. Uh, Martin and I, a number of years ago, with a student, demonstrated dispersion of slow light capsule. I think I'll focus on this, and I'm not going to have time to talk about the third harmonic generation work that we've done more recently and our ability to enhance nonlinearities in these uh, slow light structures. So let me now pose a, a, a sort of a problem. One of the limitations of all of these slow light systems, uh, whether they are atomic vapors, uh, periodic structures, all of these slow light systems have one fundamental limitation, and that is that associated with the reduction in the group velocity of light is dispersion. Okay. So the problem is you can slow a pulse of light down, but it's dispersed. Okay? And I, I can talk to people and I say, well, the analogy is I've got this wave on the beach, this wave moving along, and I want to slow it down. But I don't want it to... That's, that, the problem is all of these slow light systems break up. And there are fundamental arguments I could explain, but I don't have time for that. So what we've been investigating is the idea of a slow light uh, pulse that doesn't disperse. And we're going to exploit the nonlinearity, the same nonlinearity that we talked about, to uh, compensate for this dispersive broadening. And this might sound familiar to some of you because this uh, represents a very exciting uh, class of uh, optical phenomena that you hear in different fields, and that is the soliton. A soliton essentially is a wave packet that propagates in a dispersive medium without changing shape and it can retain its shape perfectly in spite of dispersion through the nonlinearity, through some other uh, nonlinear response. Here is the chi through nonlinearity. And it turns out that uh, many decades ago, people had investigated so-called gap solitons that are literally slowly moving solitons in periodic structures. Okay, so this is starting to sound exciting. We thought we were onto something here. And in the gap soliton, you actually have, as I said, a slowly moving pulse where the dispersion broadening is eliminated to all orders. Now that's a detail that you don't need to understand, but essentially means that it's a true soliton and that it can propagate through a dispersive medium without changing shape. Bingo. And so you now have the, 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 the concept, at least, that you might be able to slow these pulses of light down, many bits of delay without any broadening. Okay? So let me just remind everyone if they don't already know about optical solitons. So, of course, we've already uh, covered to some extent what uh, linear dispersion does. If you have an anomalous dispersing medium, you have a situation where the short wavelengths have a larger group velocity than the long wavelengths. And so a pulse going through this linear dispersing medium broadens in time, and you see the red wavelengths are at the front. This is in time. So that's, uh, that's longer time, so that's actually the back of the pulse. And the blue wavelengths are at the back, or the front. 
depending if this is time or space. So that's dispersion. Now, if we imagine that same pulse propagating in a non-linked medium where h is greater than zero, then the cell phase modulation introduces sort of a similar effect, but it's of course a different origin. The red frequencies are now shifted in the leading left hope most half of the pulse, and the blue frequencies shift in the trailing half. Okay? So you've got these two things going on, and the soliton represents this beautiful um, case where they balance. Perfectly, and there's a rigorous description underneath this based on uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation and all of the associated formalism for uh, describing pulse propagation in dispersive medium, and that's a tutorial in its own right. But here I just want to convey to you that this is an optical soliton that will propagate without changing shape because the nonlinearity compensates for the dispersive broadening. Well, it turns out solitons, the concept of a soliton has been around for a long time. And I often like to sort of remind everyone that they were actually first observed in 1834 by John Scott Russell. And the story is um, he was observing a boat being drawn along rapidly by a pair of horses. But the boat suddenly stopped. He noticed that the bow wave continued forward at great velocity, assuming the form of a large solitary elevation. Solitary is sort of the same as soliton. A well-defined heap of water which continued its course along the channel apparently without change of form or diminution of speed, a word I don't use frequently. Intrigued, the young scientist followed the wave on horseback as it rolled on at about eight or nine miles an hour, but after a chase of one mile or two miles, he lost it. And this is really the, the birth of this, uh, this concept of a soliton. Of course, here the nonlinearity is not an optical effect, but it's associated with um, the nonlinear response of the water interacting with the, the bottom of the canal and other effects that are not really important. But it was observed, and this was a recreation, I think this was 1984, I'm not quite sure, but these uh, researchers got together to try to recreate one of these um, uh, solitons in a canal. Um, so in fact, in the optical context, solitons have been around for about as long as I have been around. They, um, the theory came in the early 70s. There was a mad rush of excitement in the early 80s with uh, proposals and, and significant uh, work in places like Bell Labs and other major research labs around the world to introduce this concept of optical solitons in optical fibre communications. And so the vision was that the solitons could propagate over thousands of kilometres without being dispersed. So you, you potentially allowed uh, for this communication network now, without having to worry about dispersion. And so Molinau, who's still around, he's retired, Jim, um, Roger Stolen, who's retired, Jim Gordon, who's still around. Gordon was a student of Charlie Towns. It's worth mentioning. I think we, Bright implies not that he was very smart, rather that, which he was, which he was, once, rather that they focused on the concept of bright solitons, that there was similar work in the context of dark solitons, which I won't talk about. Um, but that was a mad rush of activity. Uh, some of these ideas have translated into today's networks. It's not quite uh, as originally um, uh, was considered back in the 80s. Um, there was work in the 90s by Desivier, Dave Payne, and Nick Doran, all very famous uh, researchers around the world um, to create these uh, soliton networks, and then the Japanese got into it in the late 90s and early 2000s. So, it's been a, uh, had a significant impact in the commercial world. Let me get back to us. So Martin and I, in fact, uh, have been looking at these prograding solitons. And uh, back in the mid-90s, we started to think about the idea of uh, solitons in gratings, these gap solitons that I talked about. We decided to call them prograding solitons, not for any profoundly deep reason, but um, um, but here we reported the first experimental observation of nonlinear effects in gratings. These solitons occur at frequencies near the photonic band of the grating. They are a combination of the negative dispersion of the grating, which dominates the material dispersion and cell phase modulation. And they propagate at velocities well below the speed of light in the uniform medium. Okay, so this was a breakthrough paper. Another paper, Martin was also on this paper, had been truncated here. But what we observed in these experiments was essentially, this is probably the nicest result, it shows you a pulse, this is the pulse sailing through at the speed of light, and this is a pulse that's been delayed by the grating due to the very strong 
uh, reduction and dispersion in group velocity effects, but notice that it hasn't been dispersed. So in other words, we've created a, here we call it a Bragg soliton, a soliton that propagates through this grating without changing shape. So within KUDOS in the last five years, we've had a big program in slow lives, and we've been really looking at a number of different architectures. Um, I'm only going to have time to talk about this work today. Uh, initially, to try to build on those early experiments in fibre Bragg gratings, also in the context of these charcotinoid wave guides you've heard me talk about, and in the context of two-dimensional photonic crystals. I'm not going to have time to talk about these, but some very beautiful science here, and even in the context of metamaterials. So let's talk about this experiment. Um, and let me just remind people how a fibre grating uh, works. So this is a grating that's been written into the core of an optical fibre. Um, and of course it has a stop band, a range of frequencies where light is forbidden and it's reflected or in transmission nothing gets through. We have a Bragg wavelength, 2NB, D is the period of the grating. And the key concept here is that the group velocity of light goes to zero right near the edge. And on a computer, it literally goes to zero, really, really small, right near the band edge. Uh, what's going on here? Well, the simple way we, we explain this is that essentially what's going on, light comes into the grating, and either it's bang, 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 and that's reflected, or if you're just outside the band edge, the light comes in, it's still bang, 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 bang bouncing back and forth, but it makes its way through. So you're not really slowing down the light in this sort of simplistic way. What you're doing is, you're, I like to say, you're forcing the light to bounce back and forth off these little mirrors. It's resonating within the structure. That's additional path length. And that translates into a reduction in the grip velocity. So the pulse of light, and I'll show you this in an animation, is truly being slowed down. So we're going to launch pulses of light right near the edge or even inside the gap, right in, just inside the gap, this sweet spot where the group velocity goes to zero on a computer and in the real world it goes down to about 10-20%. So that's where there also is this dispersion which is undesirable and the concept of course is we're going to balance that with nonlinearity. So as I've only got a few minutes, let me just illustrate this with an animation. This was put together by one of our students. So this is now slow light in the linear range. What's happening? This is based on the full formal description, exact calculation. We'll run it again. I want someone in the audience to tell me there are two things going on to this pulse. What's happening? What's the first thing that happens to that pulse? What's, what happens? What's the second thing that happens to it? Slows down. And in fact, this, this inset here shows you what you would measure if you had a detector at the end. And so you would see this is the initial pulse, this is the pulse that comes out. So it's delayed by four or five pulse widths, but it's also broadened. Okay, there's a little bit that's reflected back. So we're actually going to do something a little bit more sophisticated. We're going to actually create a gap sort on it. For those that are interested in the absolute details here, I guess the definition is that a gap soliton is when you're inside the gap. You're just inside the gap. And a Bragg soliton is a more general class of soliton that can also live outside of the gap. The papers sort of get this right, but there's often a bit of confusion. So we're going to launch just inside the band gap. There's nothing particularly profound about that in terms of the group velocities. The only difference, of course, is that at the low power limit, there's nothing getting through. So we're going to have to switch the grating on. So this is what we do. So we have, at low powers, nothing gets through. We turn up the intensity, the Kerr effect kicks in, this intensity dependent refractive index, it raises the index. The Bragg wavelength, remember, is 2 times n, d, n is the index, so the index is going up. What's that do? It shifts the grating to the right. So your initial sort of case of in the gap, all of a sudden you find yourself, hey, I can get in the grating. And the light tunnels in, and it finds, it, all of a sudden, it finds itself trapped inside this grating. Wow. You'll see this in an animation in a minute. So you're near the bandage. This is where you have very low group velocity. And it turns out, for uh, uh, formal reasons, we could show you 
but the Polsat is created is a true soliton. It is a formal solution to the governing equations and it will propagate without changing shape. So, how come that comes up twice? See, but let's see if this works. So this is below threshold. So this is the experiment you do initially. What happens? Nothing gets through. Okay? And low power, nothing gets through. Nothing matching here. It's a grating and it's a stop band. The pulses are set back. But this is where the magic happens. So now this is the grating from here to here. You're inside the gap. You're just at the edge. And let's see what happens. But I concentrate. Bang. Okay? Pretty clear on the computer. So, if we go through sort of the logic, the first thing that has to happen, it has to get inside the gradient. It has to sort of penetrate because you're in the soft band and this is this switching that I talked about. The gate is open, the light tunnels in, and it finds itself here in the book. Here I am in the grating. It settles into a soliton state wiggling about, wiggling about a little bit, but it's propagating along at about 10, 20% the speed of light, and it emerges here, and it's delayed by oh, a dozen pulse widths. It's not broadened, and in fact it's narrow somehow. The narrowing is associated with the solitonic effects. This is a soliton, so it's uh, going to shed some of the, uh, the energy that it doesn't want. And if you look at reflection, you see there's a little bite taken out. We see this experimentally, it's quite clear there's a little bite taken out of that reflected pulse. So that's all fine. The experiments turn out to be heroic and take years of hard experimental um, work from very talented students, but we need a, a grating. This is a 30 centimeter long grating. The grating is actually mounted so we can stretch it, so we can move the stop band around. The laser wave that is fixed. Uh, we then use a sampling oscilloscope and a power meter. It turns out the gradients are rapidized. Um, this is important because it means that we're reducing the side lobes in the spectrum. And it allows us to sort of tunnel in more efficiently. So this is the, uh, the gradient spectrum. So the blue is what we measure. So it's quite a deep grading. And the green is what we would calculate for its group velocity. So right near the edge, you can see the group velocity goes to zero. And this is, uh, again, measured as a function of the strain on the grating. Uh, let me wrap up by, this was reported in Nature Physics a couple of years ago, generated some excitement. Uh, there was a follow-up paper in collaboration with the Southampton Group. This is an example result. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it illustrates the type of um, behavior that we see. So the green here is the reference pulse. So that's the pulse that sails through the grating at the speed of light. Okay, so it's not affected by the gradient. Um, the blue is the pulse tuned uh, inside the gap in the state where you've got enough power to switch open the gap. Uh, and you can see that indeed we are delaying that pulse. And moreover, as we change the power, we change the position of the pulse in time. Now it looks not as good as the computer. Uh, and in fact, it, there were a number of years of efforts to try to understand what was going on here. I mean, the first thing to say is that we do see unambiguous uh, slow light soliton behavior. The pulse that is emerged, emerges from the grating is delayed by uh, four, maybe five pulse widths. Air is not dispersed. We can see that the position of the pulse depends on the power. There's a relatively straightforward explanation. As we change the power, we're changing the position of the band gap, so we're accessing different group velocities. But we also see a lot of structure, and we see these additional side lobes, and we're not, to be honest, completely clear on what's going on here. There are still some theoretical work to be done. We suspect that it's associated with imperfections in the gradings, but our theory hasn't quite uh, confirmed that, um, confirmed that um, hypothesis. I must say, it is a very, very difficult experiment to do. You're at the limits of uh, gratings, uh, and there are all sorts of uh, non linear effects going on. But it certainly was an exciting fundamental result that has established this, uh, the possibility of slow light solitons in periodic media. Um, and there's a lot more exciting research to do in this field. And I can see that I'm about time, but why don't I just do three minutes 
to give you a vision of some of the things that are also happening. So I mentioned that these structures are also being uh, considered in the context of two-dimensional crystals, silicon, wave guides, the same physics, there's nothing different here. And there's been a beautiful result from our group in the last couple of years. Uh, they also generated a lot of excitement. So Bill Corcoran and Crystal Monard were in the lab and they were injecting pulses of light from the left here at 15, 60 nanometers. And they were interested in these pulses that were being slowed down, same physics, they were looking at the output and they were seeing that the nonlinearities were being enhanced by the slow light effect and that was lovely. But what they didn't expect was that green light would be scattered out the side. Okay, and they saw it with their eye. This was a discovery. And I think that's the most exciting thing about experimental research is the thing that you didn't expect, you didn't anticipate, the good experimentalist recognises something, goes away, thinks about it, and, and comes up with a story. And so this was published in Nature Photonics. So they observed third harmonic generation. There's no surprise that <coughs> third harmonic generation is going on because it's a third order nonlinearity. What's surprising is that in silicon, in the visible, it's opaque. It's like brick. What's surprising is that we've never seen third harmonic generation in regular waveguides. If you look at the literature, there has been observation of third harmonic generation in bulk silicon, but it's typically megawatt peak powers. This is six orders of magnitude reduction in the peak power. It is a manifestation of slow light. The slow light is enhancing the, the field intensities and enhancing the nonlinearity by orders of magnitude and injects light at, it at a specific angle, um, which can be measured. And um, we can now exploit this uh, green light generation in a number of ways. And why don't I just go to one slide and show some of the real breakthrough results that were reported recently. So we're now looking at, can we exploit this slow light through harmonic generation for processing? Um, as illustrated here schematically, we can put a detector on top of the chip or even embed it in the chip and measure that green line and that reveals uh, the quality of the, uh, the, the signal that's being injected in at 1.5 microns. This is broad enough, the grip velocity is reduced over a broad enough range of frequencies that we can send 640 gigabit per second signal into this slow light structure. This is the architecture that we've been exploiting. So the silicon phototonite sits above the chip. We inject 640 gigabit signal in. We add a bit of noise and the detector, which is only a nickel, a simple silicon detector, uh, because of this cubic transfer function, we can actually monitor uh, the quality of the signal. And in a sense, this is a, a very simple and elegant architecture for doing autocorrelation uh, or normally detection based on uh, this silicon scheme. So let me, let me end uh, with this picture here. Maybe let me end with this exciting picture there. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. All right, any, uh, any questions? Yes, I'm sure. Uh, wait, how does it uh, radiate out of silicon? Like the green light? How does it radiate? Yeah. Well, the, it's a good question. You know, it's, it's actually not 100% understood. But what's going on here is you're getting three omega generated. It's not surprising that a structure like this would scatter light out of the plane. That's not terribly surprising because it's, it's finite in its spatial extent. Okay, so it's not that surprising. But it turns out you can calculate from band structure and find that the angle that it is ejected out is consistent with phase matching. The problem with the calculations to date has been silicon is not well characterized in the visible. So to do this calculation formally, and Christian Griay, Christel and others have looked at this, you need to describe silicon, its refractive index and loss, down in the visible. People just don't do that because silicon never thought about it in the visible. And so it comes out at a very specific angle. The theory predicts an angle that's slightly different, but again, we don't really know what silicon is doing. But it's certainly three omega, it's at a specific angle. And more recently, and I will mention this, uh, this is not published, we've also seen the three omega in an experiment in charcogenide. This is not unique to silicon. This is a nonlinear effect associated with a chi free medium. We are seeing green light generated at an angle, probably at a slightly different angle, in a charcogenide slow light structure that hasn't been published. 
But what's striking and upsets people often is that silicon is like brick in the visible. This is all happening in a few tens of microns. Okay, it's not quasi-phase matched in the traditional sense. Um, there's no quasi-phase matching going on here. It's happening in a sense before that even becomes relevant. It's happening very, very quickly. You won't see green light in a waveguide. If you had a waveguide, same dimensions, with no microstructure, you would not see any green light. Yes? So is that enhancing of the nonlinear effects directly proportional to how much you're slowing the light down? Or? I, I, get, I have a slide here. It's, I think it's uh, quadratic with the reduction in velocity. But in this case, it's not even necessarily that. It's a more complicated. But the work that was reported in this paper uh, that, don't look at this slide. Did I, maybe I'm not through. Maybe I've not got it in. There was an optics express that was earlier that li literally was just looking at the output here, and there we characterize the enhanced nonlinearity. And that's consistent with the underlying theory that people all use, where it's, I think, quadratic with that. Yes? Does this mean that the transmission is a loss from the signal? Yes, but it's a very good question. But it's, a ve it's actually very weak. The green is only one part in a thousand, if that is a very small effect, but it's enough that we can actually detect it with a simple silicon detector for power levels that we use in the lab all the time. But you're right, it takes a little bit away from the signal, but not much. But I don't think we would imagine, I mean, the way we are exploiting this scheme here with this detector that I showed you, this, this scheme, I mean, what we're imagining is the silicon diode could be built onto the chip. And this might be a, a, a detector, a normally detector. You're not imagining necessarily that you would rely on the information coming out. You might tap off some of the signal, send it through this chip, and use it as a normally detector. Now the subtle point is that, because it's cute, the interesting point is, other groups have created normally detectors based on two photon absorption in silicon. That's actually been established, about five, two photon absorption. That has a quadratic response. We have a cubic response. That turns out a cubic response is, is, has a, a striking advantage in terms of our ability to uh, monitor um, noisy signals. And so that last slide here, uh, this is the slide that takes a few minutes to explain, shows that we can actually measure OSNR for uh, various high bit rate signals. We have a very large dynamic range, and that's because of the cubic dependence. The quadratic dependence associated with photon absorption, it would be very, very flat. So there's actually a qualitative or a quantitative benefit. Not, it's not just that slow light's cute and this works, but there are actually quantitative advantages associated with cubic dependence. Yes? How do you see the possibilities of using uh, gap solitudes for creating a optical partners in the future, for instance, by making longer gradings or getting closer to the gap? Is it possible or is it just... Well, I was, I was pretty clear earlier on. I said that community was fixated on this buffer concept for a number of years, but I think have thrown their hands up and said it's very hard. Um, I mean, and it's almost impossible at the moment to think about it deeply because Today's engineering rules have been based on the networks that Intel's chips buffer hundreds of thousand bits. But we don't know what this future network's going to look like in 10, 15 years. We don't know. So based on today's engineering rules, I would say never. Gap solitons are wonderful science, profound new anomaly of physics. There's a lot of exciting research going on. We know about the group in Columbia has recently reported Bragg solitons in a two-dimensional structure for the first time. This is about to come out in Nature Photonics. Um, and they've shown that uh, in that context, this Bragg soliton effect can be used to compress pulses of light. But in terms of buffers, I think it's impossible to say at the moment, I mean, based on today's engineering rules, I'd say never, but we just don't know what tomorrow's engineering rules will be. And maybe in 10 years, these terabit per second networks, in the Ethernet context, you're going to need buffers that delay three or four pulse widths. Maybe that's going to make sense in that, in that world. In which case, bring on the Bragg solitons. 
So that's, that's an honest answer. Yes? Uh, how can you find out whether there, uh, there are enhancements of the uh, uh, nonlinear effects? Or is it due to the pure slow life mechanism? Or due to the localization of the beauty in nonlinear medium due to their optical Borman effect? What's the optical what effect? Optical Borman effect in periodic structure. I don't know what that is. Or it's, uh, it's just a localization of the future in one or another uh, layers in Pythonic crystal. But aren't they, well, I think they're all wrapped up in the same story, aren't they? Well, there is not a slow life, there is just a um, stationary wave. This sounds like well, something. They can to, the bed, yeah. This sounds like something to discuss over a cup of coffee, perhaps. Yeah, I'm happy, but I'd love to have more questions. But that is a coffee break discussion. I think it's all wrapped up. You can certainly get caught up in the semantics of slow light. You can certainly have big fights about whether you want to call it slow light or whether you want to call it field enhancement or whether you want to call it, you know, whatever. It's a good question to ask. And there's some controversy. And one of our good friends um, has recently proposed that slow light is a red herring. He said, he said slow light, oh, it's all a red herring. It's not slow light at all. And, Pretty striking effect either way. But I, I think here we can confidently say when we look at it on the computer, when we look at the equations and these gratings, that simulation, the animation of that slowly moving pulse looked like a slowly moving something, didn't it? That was pretty convincing. And so if you want to call that, you know, if you don't want to call that slow light, then I don't know. All but, right, other questions? Yeah. Do we see this third harmonic emission in any wavelengths other than from 1560 to 520? Good question. Excellent question. Well, it, first thing is, sure, but it relies on this dispersion engineering. So this structure was designed to have slow light here, okay, in the C-band. So it was very carefully designed. There's a lot of science and engineering that went into designing this structure. So it had slow light only from 1555. So if you went to 1545, you see nothing. Okay, you do not see anything. But I could redesign the structure and I could put that slow light band in 1545. Good question. Is that, is that a fine answer? Yeah. yeah. Okay, anybody else? I mean, I'm going to rush off in about 10 minutes, so you've got to ask me questions now, and I'm happy to have a few more, and then I'm going to. Okay, go. I think yeah, you're done for this uh, coffee break. I've got to say a shot break, do I? Yeah. All right, thanks again.